Welcome to today's edition of The World Today on Russia's disinformation campaign against the U.S. and its citizens. This edition of The World Today is co-sponsored by Perry Worldhouse and the University of Pennsylvania's Russian and East European Studies Department. Today's discussion could not be more timely, with Russia capturing the headlines almost every day and the associated disinformation pushed out by the Kremlin. For today's program, we welcome Konstantin Aborovai, a Russian politician and entrepreneur, chair of the Western Choice Party since uh, 2013, a former head of the Russian Stock Exchange, and, uh, and a leader in Russia throughout uh, since the end of the Cold War. He's the author of Russia Against USA, Russia's disinformation campaign against USA and its citizens, the topic of today's discussion. Joining him is Mitchell Ornstein, professor and chair of Russian and East European studies at the University of Pennsylvania, who'll be moderating today's discussion. Thanks to both of you, of you for joining us today. And I will now turn things over to, to you and uh, let's have a great event. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Constantine Burboy, uh, you are free to go ahead and begin your presentation. Um, we're very, very pleased to have you here on behalf of Russian East European Studies at University of Pennsylvania. Um, we're extremely pleased to, to have you here today to talk about this timely topic of disinformation. Um, uh, so I, I'm not going to add to uh, too much to what uh, Professor Horowitz just said. And uh, please, if you want to jump into your presentation, go right ahead. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to give a lecture at your university. I would like to thank everybody, but especially Professor Mitchell Orenstein for this opportunity. Uh, so the topic of the lecture is my book, Russia Against USA. I will now switch on, turn on my presentation. Just a second. Yes, this is uh, 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 the cover of my book. Uh, I'll start uh, with a few words about myself. I'm very well known to the Russian in Russia. I was very well known to the Russian in Russia. This is due, due to the fact that between 1990 and 1999, I was a source of very unusual for the Soviet Union, for the people of Soviet Union information about democracy and market economy. Since 1990, I've been very supportive of the initiatives of the West. At the end of just a second, and uh, here is Boravoy in 90s. <laughs> uh, at the end of Gorbachev's era, I created the largest commercial organization in the Soviet Union, <clears throat> the Russian Commodity and Raw Material Exchange. In uh, uh, 1993, its turnover was $2 billion a day. Uh, it was, uh, I was in the Council of Entrepreneurship under President uh, Gorbachev and then President Yeltsin. Uh, it was largely thanks to the action of the stock exchange and its brokers that the military coup d'etat, military coup in 1991 was stopped. At the same time, I had dozens of stock exchanges, banks, trading houses, television companies, uh, and news agencies. I was the co-host of several programs 
on radio and television. I have led two political parties, uh, entrepreneurial party, party of economic freedom. And uh, after its prohibition, the Western Choice Party. Together with my colleague and friend, well-known dissident and human rights uh, activist Valeria Novodvorskaya, I was a deputy of the state Duma, Russian parliament between 1995 and 2000, and created a parliamentary group called for the Atlantic Dialogue. Here is Novodvorsk and me on the Red Square, our demonstration against Chechen war. Since 2000, I have been the editor in chief of the revived America magazine, which was shut down in 2005. As an editor in chief, I was critique for my claims that an aggression, uh, aggressive anti-Western empire was being uh, uh, resurrected in Russia. I was an active uh, member of anti-Putin opposition until 19. Uh, 2019, and when preparation began for another assassination attempt on me, I migrated to the United States. Uh, I fled Russia in June 2019. In September, I started several books uh, at once. Actually, the book Russia against the USA, USSR, uh, against USA, uh, uh, was completed in 2020, and it's selling now on Amazon. The book is made in form of uh, memoirs. These are my memories and experiences, but I tried to incorporate some research and analysis inside. An attempt to understand and perhaps explain some of their uh, events I witnessed. It's the main theme is my name theme is KGB activities and activities of its successors in Russia. This is the subject I was working since 1990. The plot of the book revolves around my uh, unsuccessful attempt to warm the FBI in 1999 two years before 9-11 about the terrorist attack on the little known Bin Laden and his little known uh, organization Al-Qaeda. The message that I brought and handed over the FBI director in October 99 sounded completely crazy. Some organization is planning to torpedo Skype scrapers in New York using uh, uh, civilian planes. At the same time, then ambassador in Moscow, his political secretary and the FBI representative in Moscow took this very, this information very seriously. First, they understood who was telling them about it. And secondly, they knew Russia a little better than even FBI experts in Washington, DC. I spoke with later. 
but let me tell this chronologically. In August 90, 1999, Yeltsin and his entourage made a decision about Putin as a successor of Yeltsin. He was appointed prime minister in the Russian government. Before that, he was already the director of FSB. Uh, almost in, immediately after that, the second Chechen war began and the explosions of residential buildings started and hundreds of people died. The explosion hit in several cities, killing hundreds and injuring thousands, spreading fear uh, across the country. Russian media blamed Chechen terrorists for this bombing. A picture of explosions. Uh, in accordance with the Hasavyurt agreement between Russia and Chechen Republic of Ichkeri in January, January 1st, 2001st, the Chechen Republic was to become an independent state. It was, I wasn't friends with first president of Chechen Republic, Johar Dudaev. He was killed in 1996. Even during the war, we met with him several times. I kept in touch with the next president, Ichkeria Mathadov, and with many influenced Chechenians, Chechens. They were the first uh, to tell me that the Chechen had nothing to do with these explosions. And they explained how the FSB created sort of casus belli in Dagestan to start the second Chechen war. Putin began uh, to actively campaign to become Yeltsin's successor. The campaign for his promotion was based on the premise that Putin, who was a student of the elite Democrat Anatoly Sobchak and uh, the closest, closest associate of the Democrat Yeltsin, they would continue to build, he would continue to build a democratic state of law with market economy in Russia. As a state de Duma deputy, together with my political ally, Valeria Novodvorska, I oppose this uh, appointment of Putin, a former KGB officer for the position of the president of Russia. At this time, Anatoly Sobchak returned from his forced immigration. We were friends and he asked me to meet with him and very actively asked me to support his student Putin. To my objection that it is very dangerous that he is in no way better than another KGB uh, uh, officer Primakov who was trying to reach presidential position. Uh, Anatoly Sobchak began to explain that Putin is not a special service officer, but the intelligence but an intelligence agent and intellectual among them. In 1991, Yeltsin said the KGB wasn't a reformed organization and wanted to dissolve it. 
but in the end he retained it, divided it into separate services, border service, intelligence service, security, FSB, and so on. In August 1999, Putin started uh, uh, the opposite process. The Security Council he created was supported to unite all these services under a single authority. In addition, Putin had decided to, uh, 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 to service such as mil to join under his control any military services like GRU group. This was the reason why two officers of GRU approached me and reported that they had information about the involvement of SSB, FSB officers in the bombing of houses. Uh, as a state duma deputy, I held a press conference uh, on this in the state duma. Uh, at the same time, they told me that they are ready to give me information about the preparation of the terrorist attack on the territory of the United States. There was a lot of information, facts, and names. Uh, yes, press conference in the State Duma. Um, uh, uh, I related this information to the political secretary of the US Embassy in Moscow. She told the US ambassador in Moscow about it and she asked me to meet with the FBI representative in Moscow. He is turn asked me to meet with some of the senior staff in the FBI in Washington, DC. Uh, and I did it. Uh, 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 when I met them, I didn't see that they were writing down the details about their Russian special services activity. Uh, uh, it sounds like nonsense about civilian planes torpedoing New York skyscrapers. You can imagine how it was uh, sounding, as uh, suggested that they open their witness protection program for their GRU agents. Uh, uh, but they didn't hear my suggestion about it. Within a year, both GRU agent who transmitted information to me were killed in Russia. Analyzing this meeting, I could have, uh, I understood that the FBI agents were thrown or buffaloed, not even by the planes that were torpedoing the Skype scrapers, but the suggestion that Russian special service took any part in the preparation of such terrorist attack. The Secret Service of Russia, democratic country, our friends, they said, our hope are in many way assisting in the terrorist attack against the United States. It's impossible, they thought. <clears throat> It that seemed like real nonsense in 1999. Uh, uh, in 2003, after the congressional hearing, I took part in 
I spoke about the uh, uh, resurgence of entire Western, entire American empire in Russia. The chairman of the Congressional Security Co Committee came up to me and said, Konstantin, what, what do we hate our friend Vladimir Putin for? Is that because you cannot forgive him what he did to your friend, oligarch Michael Khodorkovsky? But the Cold War is long over now. We all won. There is no KGB anymore. I even hired six former KGB officers to work in the US Congress Security Committee. I tried to reason him. It wasn't you who hired them, but they recruited you. There is no such thing as former KGB officers. In 2005, at another congressional hearing, I was asked not to be distracted from the main topic when I tried to repeat my thesis about uh, resurrection of the empire in Russia. My consideration, I want to say something that is not in the book. Rather, there is a hint of this, but is not directly stated from the man who warned the US two years before 9-11 about the impending danger, danger, who warned the US in 2005 about the, the resurgence of anti-Western and anti-American empire without any hope of, of success, I wanted to warn my readers in my book that in the coming years, Russia will face a very dangerous uh, process of disintegration, dangerous for the West and for the whole world. Unlike the disintegration of USSR where more or less strong central of power remained, Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, Kazakhstan. Russia now will keep disintegrating in absence of uh, uh, centers of force and power. Uh, it's the main warning I want to distribute it to distribute. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I'm um, I'm supposed to get to the uh, audience questions a little bit later. I have a couple of questions of my own, but I do want to specify one of them is asking, uh, you know, are you afraid about uh, living in Russia or, um, or uh, returning? If you're living outside of Russia and um, and even living abroad, given the long reach of the Putin's regime, and I should should have specified at the beginning that uh, uh, Mr. Borvoy is living in Los Angeles uh, since 2019, and uh, indeed was not feeling safe being in Russia. But maybe you want to um, say a couple more words about that. Uh, from my experience. Uh... KGB uh, have no active operation in the United States. A lot of in London, in Europe, but not in the United States. They use a, a, a country uh, only for the propaganda campaigns. And I think it's, and they understood, understand it's dangerous for them if they start any assassinations here, like in London, because of different reasons, I feel more safe here now. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, terrific. Well, um, we're glad that you feel safe at Perry World House to speak and um, are very appreciative of you speaking out on these issues. Um, as you were mentioning, I think a little bit towards the end of your talk, um, I'm very, very curious personally, and you know, I study, uh, I've studied the sort of security posture of Russia and the approach of Russia towards the West. And it, it, it does, it see, has always seemed to me that um, Putin um, was not initially very anti-Western when he came to power in 2000. Maybe he was, some people think he was, but anyway, he was outwardly friendly to the West at that time. After 2001, he um, was the first to, uh, to call to commiserate with uh, President Bush about 9-11 attacks, which you say the FSB might've had a role in. Um, you know, but <clears throat> I've never quite understood what were the factors that caused Putin to turn against the West and exactly at what time. I, I can see that it was before the Munich Security Conference in 2007, when he announces to the world that he's against a unipolar world and for a multipolar world. That seems like a turning point, but, but what was the process that took place that of, of Putin's progressively becoming anti-Western? Was it something we did? Was it NATO expansion? Was it something he always really held close to his heart? And uh, maybe you can give us your impression. He was educated by a KGB school and they are working with uh, uh, special people and they use special uh, uh, scales, special preparation of them. And that's why uh, in the uh, KGB school, they created sort of uh, entire Western um, uh, specialists and the second scale of all KGB officers is uh, their uh, um, speci speciality in the propaganda campaign. And he can hide his real views. It's his speciality. I think he was anti-Western from the beginning when he worked in Germany like representative of KGB, ide ideological department of KGB, five department. He was always uh, be uh, anti-Western. He can create uh, image of pro democratic, pro market economy, uh, person, but I don't think they they can KGB officers they can play different roles, different characters, and it's another speciality, another scale uh, they can uh, present. I think it's interesting that sometimes I have question about his anti-Semitic conditions. Uh, a lot of question about it because sometimes he, uh, from, uh, for example, from the members of uh, uh, Russian uh, March, he is pro-Jewish uh, president, but it's not so his uh, teachers, was uh, members of KGB during the darkest time, fighting with uh, uh, Jews, anti-Semitic, enormous anti-Semitic campaign in Russia, in Soviet Union from uh, 1948 till uh, the end of Stalin's era till uh, 1953. And he can play any role. He is a very smart person. He so, can be for market economy, against market economy, if you know. He can be support, supportive by, he can be everything. 
So it's, in your opinion, then the uh, is it is it am I correct to infer from what you've said to imply that um, that the expansion of NATO, right, which happened, you know, sort of in 1997, 1999, wasn't a major factor, you know, for for Putin in turning against the West? No, it's subject of um, the no, for example, Syria, is it major factor for Putin? No, it was only uh, um, the case by which he, he can come to their uh, uh, areas of international areas in, to become a worldwide uh, political player. Mm -hmm. It, it wasn't, uh, he doesn't like uh, uh, Assad, I think. He doesn't respect him because of different reasons, but it's very, uh, very convenient instrument to uh, have influence for the international relations. Mm -hmm. He's very pragmatic, very pragmatic. I would say, see, uh, cynic. A cynic, yeah. Cynic, so, yes. So then, how do we understand, in your opinion, um, you know, Putin's motivations vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, for instance, today? I mean, or do we understand them as that um, he just wants to exert power, basically, over uh, the near abroad? That he's kind of an imperialist, or? Does he believe his rhetoric that uh, the Ukraine and Russians are one people? I mean, what's what are his kind of motivations? This always seems to be a challenging issue for people in the West to understand. I think that the main uh, uh, theme, the main goal of his activity is to save power in Russia. And uh, uh, the way a way to save imperial power is to grow imperial, to uh, expand it, uh, not only Ukraine, but uh, uh, sometimes ago it was Kazakhstan, it was Estonia, it was Latvia, it was Moldova, it was Georgia, by the way. It was in 2008, it was a real war, very active military activity on the territory of neighboring country, Georgia. Mm -hmm. But the main goal of Putin is to save power, to save his- uh, uh, His own rule. Yes. And yeah, his- So, and so his basically money. your opinion, as you expressed earlier, is that actually Russia faces a prospect of disintegration because of widespread dissatisfaction with uh, what's going on. And in order to preserve his power, he's taking external action to kind of glorify himself and glorify the Russian nation through expansion. Is yes, that the yes, idea? Yes. On the meeting with uh, Director Sakurov, if you know, mm -hmm. it was to months ago, he told that now in Russia, we have 2000 points of tension, 2000. And yeah. it's very dangerous for saving uh, uh, power to saving country like a uh, union. And uh, now it's, um, it's very dangerous for him uh, relation with regions mm -hmm. because the region it's almost exactly like in the end of the Soviet Union when uh, Baltic countries started to fight for so-called uh, economic independence. Mm -hmm. uh, shot, if you remember this word, uh, uh, I don't know how to translate how <laughs> I should. Yes, and other countries, Middle Asia countries, uh, Georgia, Armenia, and so on. 
they were trying to fight for economic independence because Soviet Union cannot survive by itself. It was a way to save local powers for them. So can I ask another question that comes from the audience here, um, you know, about the interference in the 2016 presidential election. So what did that consist of? And again, what are Putin's motivations in that? It, it seemed confusing to me to some extent because you would think that if it was a covert operation, they would have wanted to keep it a lot more secret than it was kept. <laughs> and yet it got traced back to Russia pretty in a pretty extraordinary way. What, what were the motivations and what were the, you know, um, the actual realities of that? Motivation for what? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's a lot of people think, and maybe it's true, or maybe it's not true, that the, that the Russian government interfered in the 19, in the 2016 American presidential election. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess the question, first of all, is that true? And if so, what are the motivations um, for Putin, you know, in authorizing that? Uh, you know, my uh, subject of research last 10 years was propaganda campaign in Russia. And no doubt that propaganda campaign of Russia, of Kremlin, was working to so-called to save uh, uh, elites relations with uh, America, with, this, with the United States. And that's why he was strongly against any new uh, tensions inside the United States. And that's why Putin was strongly against, uh, and his propaganda campaign, strongly against Donald Trump. And it was very clear for me because of many aspects of propaganda oriented on the West, uh, Russian propaganda. It was, it's, it's very interesting that it's not very primitive, very direct propaganda. It's very sophisticated one. It's very tricky one. It works like today with some uh, fake opposition's leader. It works like fighting with them, fighting with so-called opposition leader by the way to create new leaders of opposition. It's very tricky. It's, uh, special subject of discussion, special subject of lecture. Let yeah. me tell it next time. <laughs> okay, so I understand maybe you'll write a whole extra volume on that alone, and we can talk to you at a later point in time about that issue. Um, can I uh, can I ask you, there's a lot of people have different questions right now. Um, uh, well, there's quite a lot of questions. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, well, this is an interesting one. Um, you know, I don't want to ask you questions that, that are, you know, easily, like we can easily look this up on our own, you know, but there's one question here that looks a little harder to, to you know, which is the question of Putin's net worth or the Putin's ownership. Um, so uh, one, one per participant asked, can you estimate Putin's ownership interest in Gazprom and Rosneft? And I would maybe add to that, what is his net worth? Oh, I don't understand your question. Can you estimate uh, Putin's ownership interest? Like how much does he own of say Gazprom and Rosneft? Or I would say of other things, you know, what is, what is, is, he, is it true that he's like a very, very wealthy person what is your knowledge about that? Yeah, I know that he is, uh, uh, his uh, ownership is on the level of uh, one, two trillion dollars. It's uh, uh, the company 
one of the biggest uh, trader uh, which uh, owns by uh, Putin surrounding costs water of trailing mm -hmm. only one company and uh, estimate estimation of his ownership uh, give five uh, numbers on the level of one and a half or two trillion dollars so in that case what you're 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 feeling you know similar to mine although i wouldn't i i don't know that's that even high number shocks me but this that he's the single most wealthy individual in the world how, how does that play into his his relations with his international relations he's trying to, to save not only his power but his money his influence his structures and by the way he is thinking not only about actual conditions today's conditions but about future how to uh, export himself and his surrounding in, in case of uh, wildfire in Russia. Mm -hmm. And uh, more of that, I think sometimes they are thinking about how to uh, activate this, this uh, wildfire. Mm -hmm. for uh, to be more safe without Russia or to propose support for any, anybody, anybody who want to control very dangerous conditions can happen in Russia after uh, the, uh, the end of uh, his power. Mm -hmm. Um, another... it's, it's, it, it's very important. I would right. like to make it one more time. <laughs> it's very important to research transition uh, conditions after Putin's era, mm -hmm. because it can create very dangerous conditions, not only for Russia, but for the neighboring country and for entire world too. Mm -hmm. So he's fighting both for his um, own personal political interests, but also financial interests in essence. Yes, he has a family, he has uh, um, uh, his team, his uh, uh, friends, his supporters. Mm -hmm. He is thinking not only about himself, but about his team it's very important to save their power even after disintegration of russia mm -hmm. so another question um that is raised that's kind of relevant i think is is it fair to say that putin is more fearful of neighboring countries that have chosen democracy than he is fearful of nato in other words if democracies such as Ukraine begin to encircle Russia, the Russian people themselves may wonder why they can't have democracy. Do you think that's a, a, a greater threat than the threat of NATO? Uh, I don't think that the threat of NATO is really exists in mm -hmm. Russia. It's, uh, I would call it, the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. The rules of the game, uh, like with uh, shadow uh, opponents, uh, the rules of the game to save power, to train mm -hmm. themselves, to be in uh, good form. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, 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 this is not a real enemy, NATO. And, Everybody, uh, I remember uh, that uh, President Reagan one time told that they really think that we are, uh, he met uh, Andropov and told that this guy really thought that we want to invade them. Uh, it's very funny.
Interesting. Um, can I, um, let's see. Uh, so another, another uh, question, well, actually I wanted to raise a question since we started talking a little bit about Ukraine is, I know that you're, you're also have had some dealings with, um, with uh, President Zelensky of, of Ukraine. And um, I'm just wondering, you know, in this crisis that we have going on now, do you feel that President Zelensky has done a good job? I mean, he's facing many challenges. You know that he was elected kind of unusually in Ukraine as a representative, of both of the more Russia sympathetic forces and of the Russia opposing forces in Ukraine, right? People who were on kind of both sides of that divide supported Zelensky in his initial election. And now maybe his support has waned a bit, but I mean, it, it must be very challenging for President Zelensky to deal with this type of problem. Do you think he's done a good job? Yes, I think so. He is a very honest person. He is a very uh, active person. He is from the new generation. He is very young. And his activity now is very effective. His, lie, his last declaration about address to media, don't panic, don't distribute uh, fear is very serious, very, um, by the way, it's very uh, transparent hint for everybody who don't want to support Ukraine, but to create sort of dangerous environment around Ukraine. And the problem of Ukraine has, uh, has to be resolved by the uh, roadmap to NATO, but, uh, 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 but distributing bar of uh, weapon by stop finish uh, feeding uh, 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 Putin by, uh, by um, money of uh, uh, oil money but money off uh, for the uh, energy resources. Almost everything was done by Donald Trump. <laughs> yes, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting like to me that different US presidents have had, um, you know, uh, a lot of challenges and, and haven't really had a steady position towards Russia, oftentimes, they come in very friendly towards Russia or wanting to have more friendliness towards Russia, but end up being very confrontational with Russia, um, which I understand to be in nature. But let's address the same kind of question about President Biden. Do you, uh, when you look at how President Biden has responded to uh, uh, Russia's buildup on the Ukrainian border, sending troops to Belarus, do you believe that President Biden's done a good job in responding to those challenges? Uh, I, I would say that uh, President Biden is trying to resolve uh, Ukraine problems, problem between Ukraine and Russia with the assistance of uh, Vladimir Putin. It's different way to resolve problems, uh, to use energy, of the enemy. It's like uh, in uh, uh, Eastern uh, wrestlings uh, uh, to use energy of the enemy to resolve, to fight him. I feel something like that, but sometimes I think, uh, uh, I feel that uh, Somebody among uh, uh, Joe Biden's team are on the side of Putin, mm -hmm. unfortunately. In what sense is on, on that side? Uh, in sense of uh, Crimea. Crimea was occupied uh, in 2014. Uh, I was crying about small little men who are trying to 
uh, invade uh, the little Ukraine. Little green men, you mean, yeah. Little green men, yes. Yeah. And the answer, even from here, was no, we have no any evidence of this activity of uh, future occupation, no evidence. And from the NATO too, and I have a special um, chapter in my in my book about it, mm -hmm. about uh, cooperation between uh, uh, White House and uh, Putin's house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, may, may ask a ranges. I'm sorry. May I ask you a related question? So my understanding is that. Uh, to some extent, what your response was is that that sometimes the Biden administration is too accommodative, is trying to accommodate Putin, and therefore sometimes, you know, basically giving away too much, maybe even being on the same side as, you know, you could look at it that way. So what do you feel about President, French President Macron's uh, decision to go to Russia and the outcomes of his negotiation? I, I should preface this by saying I didn't fully research this before, but I just saw that he said that uh, Putin has announced that he's not going to invade and that's a huge victory. <laughs> but I just wonder, um, what is your impression of, of that type of effort to go and, and um, you know, and speak to Putin at, a time, at this moment? Oh, it's very weak policy and very weak position of Macron and I think it's dangerous. It looks like uh, looks like political activity because before the Second World War, when everybody were uh, trying to to reach any agreement with Hitler, and uh, uh, it wasn't very effective. We know it's. It's very dangerous to feed wild animals. The better way now is to support Ukraine. Ukraine, not only by words, by uh, any form of military activity, a uh, 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 roadmap to NATO, weapon, because they need to be need to defend themselves, Ukrainians. It's not very honest to uh, leave them uh, alone before Putin. Yeah. We have to we have to support Ukraine by any ways. Right. So um, another, you know, I, that's an interesting uh, answer. I mean, so basically you know, talking to him, that's not going to really do anything except signal weakness. You need to just support uh, Ukraine if he's threatening Ukraine. Um, and I just want to ask you, you mentioned a couple of things also about the Trump-Putin uh, relationship before, um, which sounds a little different from the typical view about it. But, you know, honestly, the Trump-Putin relationship to me was a very, very confusing relationship, right? Because on the one hand, um, you could see that, uh, that Trump was really reluctant to say anything negative about Putin. You in your book mentioned that he's constantly showering Putin with praise, right? Which may have been, I don't know, may have been smart, you know, technique to deal with somebody like Putin, or it could have been weak. It could have been perceived as a weak activity action. At the same time, um, his, a lot of people will point out that, you know, that Putin didn't decide to invade Ukraine during the Trump administration, right? There were also very stern sanctions that came out during the Trump administration on Russia, economic sanctions, and Trump was more willing to uh, provide weapons, certain weapons to Ukraine, uh, all of which were elements of, I guess you would say, a sort of stronger response to Russia. So you have this kind of like unusual balance, right, between weaker and stronger uh, approach. And then, of course, you also have the business deals and the spying, you know, that's alleged in the uh, campaign outreach, you know. So what, what, do you, what do you think about this Trump-Putin relationship? Did they have a relationship? And what was it about? And 
and how can we understand it if if at all at the moment i think i think we have answer by uh miller commission mm -hmm. they had no relations putin was looking for trump uh, around uh restroom to have any meeting with him to arrange any meeting with him it was a very smart strategy uh, trump start to compete with putin on the european market by energy resources mm -hmm. and just after it was stopped russia russia start to distribute uh missiles to uh middle east immediately yes and i think it was more more smart strategy mm -hmm. more long uh thinking strategy mm -hmm. so you're talking about trump's initiative to export us lng to europe as a kind of replacement of of russian gas um yes, yes. and so that kind of gas diplomacy um you know um so but aside from that you're saying also that 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 trump refused to meet with putin actually but he did meet with putin several times right um a little bit less than president biden so you think that biden is, has met with putin <laughs> Yes, they met, they spoke uh, several times. Okay. And I think it's, uh, it was uh, the President Biden's initiative to his address to leaders of NATO countries mm -hmm. to listen Putin, to listen his worries, to listen his, and they immediately got uh, 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 ultimate. Interesting. So um, maybe to change it up a little bit, uh, I have an interesting question um, from Mariana Yorovskaya, or rather um, question a little off topic. What studies on Russia's politics do you consider important? Like, what are you reading about Russia that we're not reading or that you think is important you would recommend? Um, uh, I don't know a lot. <laughs> now it's now it's very, uh, very tricky conditions, very unusual conditions for Russia, very transparent, by the way, conditions. And I think the most important thing now is to research uh, Russian uh, conditions, Russian future, Russian development, because any moment, like with the Soviet Union, any moment the process in Russia can start and it will be very dangerous mm. process. I uh, <clears throat> push a lot of different uh, think tanks to start this re research about future transparent pro the future transition process in russia mm -hmm. it's very important okay so that's a good advice for perry world house we need to talk about the future transition in russia sure. um may i ask a quest another question from the audience um our students you know are very career focused um they want to get jobs i guess it's normal right um and um they asked one asked do you have any advice for students who want to work on u.s russia relations for instance in the field of national security or even academia you know we have a program with uh, russia with the european university of st petersburg a dual degree program but i think that this student is asking more in the security area do you have any advice of people who want to work on u.s russia relations it's a pretty challenging time in some ways and now we have seen more oriented um, research on uh, US-China relations. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but China is not far from, <laughs> from Russia. And uh, they are very close, not only geographically, but uh, in their relations and a lot of problems connected with China can be uh, resolved by relation with Russia, by research of Russia. And uh, the history of relations between Russia and China is very interesting, very productive, and very uh, uh, influenced on the actual conditions, both Russia and China. And maybe it's the most important part of the research, uh, relation, actual relations between Russia and China. For me, it's very interesting last declaration of Putin and Xi Jinping is a very interesting document to research. It's about uh, uh, about future of uh, human nature. It's interesting, by the way, because they are trying to play to plan to plan uh, future of the whole world, and they have power to influence on that future. Hmm. So uh, you're concerned about that relationship? Very much. Yes. Um, I, I think that one of, this, one of the uh, people from the audience is asking, I think, a good question. So um, the book is obviously on disinformation in the US. So we, perhaps we should return to that issue. Um, towards the end here, which is that, um, you know, what is, does Russia have a sustained disinformation campaign against the US? If so, what are the objectives? When did it begin? What is it achieved? What are some examples? How, how can it be addressed? What's going on right now? What's going to happen in the future? I mean, how do you see those issues? Yes, uh, the propaganda campaign on the United States is very active by promoting the program of uh, uh, Besmertny Polk, if you know, the program of uh, 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 main ninth victory of the Soviet Union over the fascism, and the last conception that uh, uh, fascism was uh, overcome not by uh, uh, United States or allies of Russia, but Russia itself without any support. It's uh, one of the stages of the propaganda campaign. And um, but uh, mostly they are working in, uh, I mean, special forces, they are working in the United States mostly for the laundering money. They don't want to create some problems for them. And uh, I think that few, they, some of them, uh, I mean, Kremlin team, they, see their future in the United States. And they prepare their base here and they don't want to create problems for the future uh, uh, invasion, let me say here. Mm -hmm. So this brings another uh, audience question that um, former Foreign Minister Kosirev um, who's also a U.S. resident now, apparently, said that the only way of really hurting the Russian elite is to block their access to their fortunes, um, including real estate, which is often in the Great Britain and the United States. Um, do you agree with that? And do you, I mean, why haven't the U.S. and the U.K. acted more forcibly to kind of uh, block the fortunes of the Russian elite? 
Uh, it's very dangerous because we are speaking about criminals who are trying to save their power, save their money, not only in Great Britain, but here it's uh, dirty money, uh, criminal money. And I think it's a problem of uh, criminal money are dangerous not only because they have very stamps on it, but because owners of the criminal money are criminals. And to defend country uh, uh, more effectively is necessary to fight with criminals, with criminal money too with laundering money, with, it's very, uh, very light, very, very primitive point of view that uh, uh, money doesn't smell. In this case, it's their smell, smell, yeah, they smell too much and they uh, create a big, a lot of problems here in the United States. In the, now it's it's created already a lot of problems in Britain. Uh, criminal money. Yes, it's uh, subjects need to be observed. Mm -hmm. and <coughs> final question. I think we may not have time for more than this because we're going to try and wrap up right at five fifteen. But. Um, you know, considering the current situation, many, many people are worried. I mean, you could say this was a propaganda war in a way that a lot of people say Putin wanted to get a lot of attention for himself and attention for his complaints about how the West has mistreated Russia. Um, and, but, you know, some, a lot of people at this point are, are concerned about war breaking out. What do you think of the prospects like is will war break out in fact over Ukraine, of course, acknowledging that there has been a war in Ukraine for eight years, a more low intensity conflict in the East. But do you think a, a bigger war will break out and um, and if not what's the end game both for Putin and for the West, how are they going to kind of overcome um, that crisis. <clears throat> I think it's not normal when in the center of Europe one country occupied big territory of another country. But now we are speaking not only about Ukraine, but about Moldova, about Georgia, uh, 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 Ab Abkhazia and South uh, Ossetia. Uh, and about other countries, and uh, it, it has to be, it has to be resolved. It's very, very stupid position that it will resolve by itself. If you remember after their uh, Georgian war in 2008, uh, was uh, reached the agreement between uh, Medvedev and Sarkozy that Russia will leave Georgia. But it doesn't happen, didn't happen. And uh, the same thing with Abkhazia, the same thing with uh, and uh, <clears throat> but the main problem now it's Putin and uh, uh, to feed a wild animal like we see it now by supporting his activity his interest, his um, behavior, it's very dangerous. I think that the main point now is Putin. 
And when leaders of the West are trying to reach any agreement with him, with criminal power, it's more, much more dangerous than to fight with him. Sometimes <clears throat> we have to be strong. We have to defend our interest, our democracy, our freedom. And no way without uh, using uh, military force, unfortunately. Interesting. Well, thank you so much, um, you know, for a fascinating presentation. We look forward to further uh, uh, volumes of your book about um, the ongoing sort of uh, campaign, uh, disinformation campaign of Russia versus the West. And the kind of, I think that the book has another theme, honestly, which is this kind of question that you ended on, on, on how to uh, manage the relations with the power that is not necessarily rational and pragmatic, but is actually, as you say, sort of criminal and uh, often destructive, self-interested and destructive, right? Um, that it can't necessarily be approached in the same way as one might approach, you know, a different kind of opponent, you know. So, um, so we're appreciative for you sharing your insights about that. And thank you for coming to uh, Perry World House and to, uh, to the University of Pennsylvania, um, Russian and East European Studies Department really thanks you for this illuminating uh, portrayal. Um, and uh, I'm going to hand it over to, I guess, Michael Horowitz, I think, uh, for the last couple of words. Maybe not. <laughs> Okay, well, um, maybe I got that wrong. <laughs> Apologies, everybody. Um, so I'm going to thank you on behalf of Perry World House and on behalf of the Department of Russian and East European Studies. We uh, periodically want to get and do get um, leading experts and practitioners of politics um, from Russia to speak about issues and to give uh, a different insight into the types of questions that we uh, often discuss. And uh, we've certainly got that tonight and or this afternoon. And I really appreciate uh, uh, Mr. Konstantin uh, Borovoy for spending your time with us. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. Yes. And uh, I can also mention that there are, uh, we invite people to sign up for the Perry World House um, mailing list to be advised of other, um, other events. Um, in next week, there's a book talk on reconsidering reparations, um, future challenges for the US Army. As you know, a number of events that are always here, uh, Perry World House, um, and of course, Russian and East European Studies. We have uh, other seminar series uh, lined up for this spring on a variety of topics on historical memory um, and uh, on contemporary issues. So we look forward to your participation in those as well. Thank you so much again. And um, I really hope that at some point uh, next time we'll be able to see you here in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, good afternoon to you. Good evening. Thank you.